Google up OKC Web Devs. Back to the talk that you came for. So how Swift works under the hood. I think I've set the stage a little bit there. So we're going to talk about a handful of different uh, things. And at the very end, time permitting, I've got a demo that, that Swift app I was telling you about. I wanted to show it off a little bit just to show it's written in Swift UI. So if you are not as familiar with Swift UI, that'll give you a real life example of a relatively simple project that I built. Um, but the reason I built it is because it's something that I wanted that didn't exist. And because it's what I wanted, it's very specific. I knew it didn't exist. So I'll, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So with Swift, we'll talk about what it is. We'll talk about the history of Swift. We'll talk about the programming concepts of Swift. This is the internals I was talking about earlier. We'll talk about storyboard versus UI nature of how you can code in Swift, as well as it's kind of just a fundamental way to program in Swift. And we'll talk about the future of Swift, at least as far as what I can tell at this point. And then, of course, our demo. So there will be minimal code in this talk. And you're probably thinking, why even have this talk then? Well, it's like I mentioned. Um, I think it's great to know syntax. And I think it's great to know how to code. And that's when you're first learning a language. That's, of course, what you want to start with to get going. But beyond that, like I said, I think it's important to know how languages differ from one another and what makes them differ, as well as, you know, maybe this talk will help show you why some of the decisions in Swift are the way they are based on its history, or maybe it'll show you what to look out for in the future of Swift, all of that stuff. So let's we'll start with what it is. So if you go to Wikipedia, you'll find the generic, or maybe this is even from the Apple page, it's one or the other. I think it's from Apple site, actually. Swift is a powerful and intuitive programming language for iOS iPad OS, Mac OS, TV OS, and watch OS, basically all of the Apple uh, platforms. This is actually, um, it actually is more than this. We'll talk about that during the future section of Swift. But this is what likely what you've known Swift as, just it is the Apple programming language. Beyond that, it is a general purpose multi-paradigm language, it means it can do, it functions in a variety of different ways. Some of those ways are it's an object-oriented language. You might be familiar with this from C++, Java, uh, Python, Ruby, a, a significant amount of languages are object oriented. Just means you can have um, classes, you can instantiate objects. Um, you have protocol oriented as well. Uh, that protocol in Swift is very much similar to how an interface works in a variety of languages. If you've used C Sharp, Java, um, many languages support interfaces. Those are some of the bigger ones. Uh, protocols are very similar to that. So it's, it handles that. And it's declarative. That's probably less known what that means. And we have a whole section about what it, what declarative programming means. But And Swift is more than just this. These are just some of the bigger concepts. Um, gone are the days of saying that something is just object oriented. I think most languages that are popular these days, unless, you know, barring HTML, CSS, and some of the more um, specific featured languages, I think most of them tend to be object oriented, even if they weren't originally that way. Um, you can look at PHP was originally not object oriented and they added it in. Uh, JavaScript is somewhat similar. Uh, it was always an object oriented language, but recently over the last you know, five to 10 years, they've added in the normal object oriented behavior you would expect you, that, you're, that you're familiar with, the class based stuff. So I, I, a lot of languages are using this. So I think just saying it's OO is a misnomer. I think it's every language has more features than just that usually. Swift is open source. We'll talk about when that happened, uh, but you can hack on Swift. You can use it. It's going to be free to use for the foreseeable future. It is built as a replacement for Objective-C. Objective-C has been around for a long time. Um, and uh, personally, I tried to learn Objective-C back in the day. It was not my favorite syntactical language. I didn't get too far with it. Swift, in my opinion, has been just the complete opposite experience. It's been very exciting to work with. And uh, some of the notable architecture decisions, these are just some high points that they'll mention on the Apple site. But in general, there's no semicolons. Uh, I know that's, you know, whether you like that or don't like that, that's how it is. Swift uses type inference. This is a feature of it being statically, it, in, of it employing static type checking. We're going to get into later what that means. Uh, but that just means that you can, you, you can define a type like string, or you can not define it and Swift will infer what that type is. Strings are UTF-8. That The big thing there is you can use emojis in your strings because that's what we all want to do every day. Um, memory is managed by what's called reference counting. We're going to get into what this means. That's a form of garbage collection. And uh, again, we'll, we'll uh, so Swift does employ garbage collection. That's a good thing to mention there. It's not, you know, there's no manual memory management like there was in Objective-C, and of course, C as well. 
uh, functions are first class citizens. That means you can set them to variables. You can pass them around. You can accept them as parameters to your functions. This is under a bigger concept of functional programming. We'll talk about that. There are optional types. That means you can define something as null or a string, and that allows you to have some extra power. And um, it has interop with Objective C. <clears throat> That's more true for Swift as opposed to Swift UI. We'll talk about that later. But um, you know that would be pretty bad to have decades worth of work in Objective C and to have to not be able to use it in Swift. So you can. I've actually worked on projects recently um, that did have libraries written in Objective C and they had headers written in Swift. So I was able to use them in Swift. So my personal favorite for coming, at least syntax wise, coming from a non-Swift background is this guard keyword. And I think if you are using Swift, you've seen this before, I'm sure, but it's very common in a function to say, to check your, you know, check your arguments or check some situation. And if anything is null, then you want to exit early. Um, that's just a very common thing. Sometimes you have to do that, you know, four or five times, depending on how many arguments you have or whatever null checks you need to do. Guard is a language feature of Swift that will, it, it just has a nice syntactic sugar way to handle that for you. So in this situation, if Lee starts is, um, is null in any situation, then we'll hop into this else block and we have to exit the scope here. We can't just have a, you know, a different situation. So we'd have a continue here or a, or a return or something. But what, what that means is we guarantee that if we get to this part of the code, we can guarantee that Lee start is not null. So it just, you know, it's just a nice, clean way to handle that situation. And, and I really like that. That's something I really enjoyed in Swift that I really haven't seen in other languages. So getting back to what it is, Swift supports Apple, Cocoa, and Cocoa Touch frameworks. And you've probably heard of these, you know, that's the name of this group is a uh, Cocoa Heads OKC. But if you're not familiar with what that actually means, Cocoa is the application runtime for um, the Apple operating systems and Cocoa Touch is what it is for iOS. So here's an example of what an iOS app would actually look like as far as the layers. You have your application and you, in the application, you interact with the Cocoa Touch layer here and that interacts with all of the core APIs that, that you use. Um, you know, if you need to make a request to a server and get access to data, access the file system, all those types of things, Cocoa Touch is that intermediary. And Cocoa Touch is on iOS, what, it is, what Cocoa is to, um, you know, Mac OS and the, the more, uh, the, the not mobile operating systems. So, and that's honestly, that's as far as we're going to get with what it is. So that's just some background of Swift. And I think a lot of you probably knew a lot of that, but if some of that was news, then I'm, I'm glad to hear it. So for the history behind Swift, is it was first released in June 2nd, 2014 at the, uh, at the Worldwide Developer Conference. I'm pretty sure that's what the WWDC stands for. So it was announced there and that was Swift 1 and it really didn't gain traction until Swift 2 became announced uh, the next year at 2015. There were some significant fundamental updates done at that point to get to Swift 2. Uh, I think that's when a lot of traction started building and eventually in um, 2015, later that year, Swift became open source. I think that helped get the community um, more wanting to jump from Objective-C to Swift as well. And eventually in uh, the beginning of 2018, Swift became more popular than Objective-C. I'm not sure what the metric is here. Uh, there's, I'm not sure what stats or statistics they use, but um, in general, um, this is what I found. So that's, that's pretty big. Uh, and that's a good trend. Cause again, I, I, Swift is clearly the future of Apple coding. Um, you can still use Objective-C and still write it and still interop with it with Swift, but, um, and, you know, for legacy work you've done with Objective-C, you will want to be able to do that. Um, but, um, this is, this is a good sign for, for Swift in my opinion. And that's it. That's all we're going to dig into the history where we're going to spend a lot of time, honestly, are the, uh, programming concepts here. So, cause we're going to, we have a lot of things that we want to cover here and let's just run through these real quick and we'll talk about what we want to do after this. We're going to talk about what it means to be a compiled language versus an interpreted language and what Swift is in that. We're going to talk about what static and dynamic type checking means. Uh, you may have heard of those phrases before, but maybe not know what they mean, or maybe you do. And we're going to compare what Swift is. We're going to talk about what type safety is, and I guarantee you probably know what this is, even if the phrase might seem vague. And we're going to talk about how Swift works with that. We'll talk about concurrency, about garbage collection. I alluded a little bit to, to garbage collection earlier. We'll talk about functional programming um, and how Swift fits into that. And lastly, we'll talk about what imperative and declarative coding means. This is where we're getting into a lot of the language agnostic concepts. I've, a lot, everything, everything you're going to learn here will be something that 
is base information that you can apply and ask questions to any programming language. But for each of these, we're going to say exactly what Swift is. So starting off with, uh, and this is not every programming concept by any means. Uh, these are just some of the big ones. There's, you know, we, we have really haven't talked about how memory is allocated. We're not going to get into that. Um, and there's just a ton of other under the hood concepts that we're not going to touch on. But these are some of the bigger, the, some of the bigger ones. So let's talk about what it means to be compiled versus interpreted. Now, um, right off the bat, we'll say that Swift is compiled. Uh, you've probably heard of that. We'll just, that's, that's just a flat out truth. But what does that actually mean? Like, what is what are the benefits and the detriments you get from being a compiled language? So before we dig into that, uh, and I've been saying it myself, um, when we say something is compiled versus interpreted, it would be incorrect to say that the language itself is compiled or interpreted. Uh, what you're really referring to is an implementation of the language. So what that means is um, I'm not familiar with the different implementations of Swift. I think there's probably just the big one, but there might be others. But Let's take a look at Ruby, which is a language that I am more familiar with. There's a main implementation of Ruby that is the normal Ruby syntax, but there are other implementations that still are the same Ruby syntax, but because the language is implemented in a different way, it's written using different tools. The original Ruby is written in C, um, but there's a version of Ruby called Iron Ruby, which is still Ruby, but it is written in a JVM language and it runs on the JVM. And there are fundamental features that change in Ruby because of that. Uh, and it and but the syntax is all the same. Um, and those are both implementations of the language. So the language is Ruby. You know, the language is an abstract thing. It's just how how are we communicating? The implementation is where you get your actual features and it's like what's saying this is a compiled implementation versus an interpreted imp implementation. Um, you're probably familiar with C, C is a uh, compiled language. You have to compile it to machine code, but there are interpreters for C. And if you use those, then you've transformed C into an interpreted implementation. So a language can be either. Um, what we, when we say the implementation, we're usually referring to the most common implementation. So like I mentioned Ruby, Ruby, the most common implementation is an interpreted language, as an interpreted implementation. And while there probably are compiled implementations, no one's gonna assume Ruby is a compiled language. So Getting back to Swift, the, you know, you could write your own interpreter for Swift and it would be a interpreted language then, but um, the most common implementation of Swift is the one that runs in the Cocoa environment and, and you know, runs on the, all the Apple systems and that's a compiled implementation. So all that's to say, and not the language itself, we talked about that. All that aside, let's talk about what the benefits are being a compiled uh, language versus an interpreted language. So to be a compiled language, the main benefit you get, the pros are um, you get speed and performance. You know, you're compiling it into native machine code to run on whatever environment you're putting it in. So it's getting compiled to run uh, on the Cocoa runtime there. If we're talking about C, it's getting compiled into machine code to run on your operating system. Um, same thing with Rust, I believe is a compiled language. The, you're compiling into a more binary language, a binary, uh, well, in the, in the case of C, it's an actual binary. Um, and you get as you get the maximum speed and performance you can out of that. And also some of the pros with that, you um, typically compiled implementations, typically languages that have a compiled implementation as their main implementation, usually use static type checking. We're gonna talk about what that means in a little bit, but you get the benefits of that. Um, and that's that's kind of a flip of the coin there. Some some of them are good, some of them are bad. We'll talk more about that in static type checking. But speed and performance are the big reasons. Uh, there are some cons though, for sure. The biggest con is that usually it's not cross-platform. Um, kind of going back to our C example here, if I write C on uh, a Mac, which is a Unix-based system, I cannot guarantee that that C will compile on a Windows device. They're just fundamental different environments to run the machine code from. So you usually can't guarantee that something is cross-platform. So in this case, you know, the most common implementation of Swift will run on the Cocoa environment, but let's say that there is another platform that Swift should be expected to run on. Um, if it stays as a compiled language, then we can't guarantee that that would be the case. Swift's kind of locked into, you know, Apple's ecosystem. So it's, it's kind of get to buy there. So being compiled, this is less of a concern, but for, that's one of the big reasons why Java was a pretty big hit in the early mid '90s, is because it was cross-platform. It's an, it, and we'll talk a little bit about Java and, and further on in this section. But um, full-blown compiled languages usually can't make that claim. 
uh, going on. You have to compile every time. Um, usually there, there's, there are concepts of just-in-time compilation where you can sometimes make changes in the compiler runs and auto hot, hot reloads your application, but still there's a whole process that has to be built for that. Um, the compilation step, I'm sure you've seen some XKCDs about it. Uh, it can take as long or as short as, as, you know, as it does really it depends on how complicated your app is. But if you've worked with a compiled language, you know that sometimes when you hit the compile button, it's time to go get a coffee. Um, and because most languages are statically, most compiled implementations employ static type checking, that means you're not dynamically type checking. Um, it's an either or there. So we'll talk about what that means a little bit later. Uh, let's compare that with an interpreted language though. So um, I mentioned Java. Java's a bytecode language. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit, but it does run on an interpreter. Um, but Ruby and Python and PHP are all full blown interpreted implementations as their main, imp their main implementations are. So the benefits you get there are, it's usually cross-platform because the way interpreted languages work, you build an interpreter and that's like the JVM, the Java virtual machine is an interpreter. And that project, that runtime is cross-platform usually. You have to, the creators of the implementation have to build it for each platform, but you as the developer don't have to care about that. It would be, if there's something that works on Windows and that doesn't work on Mac, in your language, that's a language bug um, that you shouldn't be expected to fix. Whereas with C, um, you just have to know things work differently. So they're usually cross-platform and there's no compilation step. An interpreter just reads code line by line. Um, so you just, you know, make a change. You usually have to restart your application, but uh, it just, you know, runs right back up. It's just, there's no intermediary compilation step. And they're typically interpreted implementations usually use dynamic type checking. Uh, we'll get into all that. I keep bringing these up. And then those cons. Cons are the flip side of all of this. You do get less speed and performance because you're running, you're, you're reading your code line by line through an interpreter, which is a program, as opposed to having a binary file that just runs on your operating system um, or your runtime like Cocoa. So you get less speed performance. There's, you cannot argue with that. And um, I have a typo here. I say you don't usually have benefits of dynamic type checking. That should say static type checking because uh, we do usually get dynamic type checking with interpreted implementations. Um, that's the, I think that's the last time I'll mention the type checking until we actually talk about it, because I think I mentioned it uh, several times uh, already. And there's one more, uh, there's one other category in the compiled versus interpreted uh, discussion, and that's a bytecode implementation. So Java is this, as well as um, C Sharp, you have the, um, the common intermediary language for, uh, for like the whole .NET environment. Those are bytecode languages. What that means is it combines um, comp compilation and interpretation into one process. You uh, um, and Swift is not this, at least not at this point. You uh, combine. You you, be, you basically compile your language into a bytecode, which could be any you know many languages could compile to the same bytecode, and then you run that bytecode on an interpreter. So the interpreter won't read it won't read it line by line because it's compiled but it will still run it. Um, so you still have the overhead of an interpreter running your, pro your code, but it's a compiled process. So it's more optimized. Um, all the, your references to variables and, and memory management can be a little bit more efficient. And the big reason why bytecode is a thing is, um, oh, let's talk about the benefits. You get some of that uh, performance you get from having being a compiled implementation. It's usually cross-platform. That's the whole benefit of being a bytecode. You know, Java is a bytecode language implementation, the main one is at least. Um, and you can use the same VM, that's your interpreter usually, it's a virtual machine, as other bytecode languages. So the big thing to know here is you've probably heard of the JVM, that stands for the Java Virtual Machine. That's Java uses that uh, for its main implementation, but pretty much every language out there seems to have an implementation that will run on the JVM. And But the benefits there are, you can actually use code typically that's written in another language um, in, your code. So if I had a if I had a function in Java uh, that I was you know compiling and running on my JVM, if I had a script written in Ruby, as long as I had proper um, bridges and config files set, I could use this Java function at least the features of it, and I could I could, I could you know at least invoke it in Ruby. Um, there's there's some setup you have to do with that, but that's a benefit of JVM. But a lot of languages have. Um, a lot of languages that they have an interpreter, they will use the JVM as their interpreter. It's just a very common interpreter. And I think we talked about this. Can you, you convert your language into the JVM bytecode and then you run it on the JVM and then you can, you know, you're now using a bytecode process. 
Okay, that was all comp compilation and interpretation. Um, that and this section are the biggest ones, and then it'll be pretty smooth sailing after that. So I've mentioned static and dynamic type checking a lot. Um, so let's just recap. Swift is a compiled language, and I mentioned compiled languages usually use static type checking, and Swift is a statically type checked language. So what does that mean? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, start right off the bat. Uh, type checking is actually a language feature. You have to use it for um, any implementation. So to say Swift is a statically typed language is accurate, um, but we would have to say that the most common implementation of Swift is a compiled implementation. That's, you know, it probably means tomato, tomato to you, but that's the, that would be the correct vernacular. So what does static type checking mean? Um, well, if you've used C Sharp or Java um, or, or Swift, if Swift is dynamic or statically type checked, You'll notice um, some similarities there, like you cannot compile until errors have been fixed, until everything matches up. That's a feature of static type checking. You, your errors are, are tracked, or your, your types are checked at compile time. That's what the static means, at compile time. And the benefits of that are you get to track your errors early um, before you even run it. And a lot of the times your IDE will give that information to you beforehand even, even before you compile. Um, it does make runtime modifications more challenging. So concepts like metaprogramming, reflection, um, those things are a little bit more challenging to do in these languages. Um, we'll talk about that in the dynamic typing section. And uh, static type checking is more rigid on your development style. This is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, you know, like what I mean here is if you're writing Java or C Sharp or Swift, you're typically locked into an IDE or at least a common tool set of IDEs, you usually you want to have an IDE. And that's just because, like I said, hopefully your IDE lets you know of errors before you compile. Um, if they didn't, it would be pretty annoying. But um, imagine coding Swift without Xcode or coding C Sharp without Visual Studio. Um, of course, it's possible. I would argue that Xcode interface builder is kind of a unique thing because you do need that. But um, imagine coding Java like without an IDE as well. It would just be a little bit more complicated. Um, and that's largely due to the static type checking. So dynamic type checking is the opposite. You check your types at runtime. That's the difference. So you don't check it at, at the beginning. You run into errors as you run into errors with types. And that might sound weird, but it also grants you a lot of extra features. So it's easier to implement reflection and metaprogramming. These are runtime code decisions you can do. And metaprogramming is very complicated. It's a complex thing that you're not going to do right off the bat, but it involves things like changing an object's type at runtime. Um, clearly, you can't do that in statically typed languages, at least very easily, because you have to check a type at the, run at the beginning. Um, you can write new functions in the middle of your code. You can define new classes. All these things that you might think, why would I be able to do it? And I would say it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you might run into that need one day. Um, but they're just, uh, it's easier to implement that in a dynamically type checked language. Swift is not a dynamically type checked language. Um, it's also easier to introduce type related bugs into your code. So if I have a, a, a type related bug, um, and let's say I didn't run into that code until midway through the runtime, then I'm just going to, it's just going to crash on me. And that could be an issue for production. Um, it makes tests, it makes, it, it makes you have to really want to test your code. Um, and that's where the ideas of unit testing, integration, end-to-end -end testing become a lot more popular um, in dynamically type checked languages. So uh, one thing that kind of goes with type checking a lot is the thought of type safety. Um, type safety means the difference between strong and weak typing. And Swift is a strongly typed language. I think I mentioned that here. Yes. Now what that means, there's a very common conception that being strongly typed means that you have to define the type when you define a variable. Like if I say string foo equals whatever the string is, then it's a strongly typed language. Otherwise, it's not. And that's not the case. That is not true at all. And you know, in Swift, you can define a string without having to say your type, or you can specify your type. That doesn't have anything to do with whether it's strong or weakly typed. That is um, um, in in a in a statically typed language like Swift is. That's called type inference. It will infer the type in a, in a dynamically typed language. You can still have that behavior. Like PHP employs that, for example, or it can. Uh, that's called duck typing. We're not really going to dig into that much here, but um, it's not strong versus weak typing is the big thing I want to mention. Strongly typing refers to how type safety is enforced, and that's not a syntax-related thing. You won't see that. Uh, you'll just get errors if there are problems. 
So strong type, let's look at an example here. And this is a language agnostic. Let's say I have a variable X is one as an integer. I have another variable Y is two, which is a string. What happens if I try to add them or concatenate them? Because the plus symbol typically in many languages will work with numbers and it will work with strings for a concatenation. What's gonna happen here? Well, if your language would error out, um, then it's a strongly typed language. That means it enforces type safety much more strict than it would a weakly typed language. So Swift will will fail at this. Um, and languages that are also strongly typed, um, it has nothing to do with syntax, we've covered that. So some examples of strongly typed languages, uh, these might blow your mind, honestly. Java, you probably heard of that, but Python and JavaScript are strongly typed as well. And that's, you may not have thought that because you don't have to specify those types in syntax. Again, it's not syntax related, but Python and JavaScript will both air out in those situations. Um, I should review JavaScript. I think I mentioned that one time and someone may have corrected me that it is not. Um, I will. I would need to verify that. So if that's not true, then I know Ruby is, is um, strongly typed, which is one of those where you might not think it is. But some, let's look at some weakly typed languages, in which case, let's, like, let's go back to the example, in which case this would pass. And what would happen typically is um, this would get interpreted as a string or um, interpolated as a string. And then this would just become you know, the, the string 12. That's likely what would happen. Looking at the weakly typed languages, um, PHP is weakly typed. That's probably, you may have assumed that, but C is also weakly typed too. And that's probably a mind blower there because um, you have to be very explicit about what you're doing in C but it will actually let that situation happen um, and it will just convert it to a string. So that's what type safety is. Uh, and I mentioned Swift is a strongly typed language. So maybe we should just review quick, you know, where we're at so far. We know Swift, the main implementation, which runs on Coco is a uh, compiled language. Swift as a language is statically typed. It employs static type checking and it is strongly typed. Um, so to kind of end this whole concept of type safety and, and type checking, this is a good thing to, <clears throat> to remember. Static versus dynamic type checking means when the type safety is enforced. Is it enforced at compile time or at runtime with dynamic type checking? Type safe, I'm sorry, strong versus weak typing means how type safety is enforced. Is it enforced strongly? Um, which again is not a syntax thing. <clears throat> then um, then it's then, you know, that's that's the how part. Uh, is it not employed strongly? Then meaning again, not a syntax thing then that's weak typing. Okay, and we got a couple more sections here for programming concepts, but we've covered the big ones. Um, if your brain, if your head is sweating by now, don't worry, it's gonna get a little bit easier. Uh, we're gonna just touch on some of these other concepts. So concurrency, um, Swift does support concurrency. Many languages do, but they actually don't support it in exactly the ways that you would think. So for starters, concurrency is different from parallelism. Concurrency just means being able to run things in a certain order. Like I can start a task, but then before that task finishes, I can pause it, start a new task, that task finishes, and then I can resume the other task. That's concurrent behavior, um, but it is not parallel behavior. Parallel behavior means actually running two processes at the exact same time with their own dedicated resources. And to do parallelism, you need to have multiple CPU cores. Um, that's just, you know, so it does depend on your machine. Like if you were on a single core, CPU running a uh, running a link running some asynchronous code in a language that supports parallelism, it actually wouldn't be parallel because there's no physical way that it could do that. Um, but concurrency just means does it have the capabilities? Can I run things um, in you know in a different order than synchronous synchronous order? Yes, okay, then it's concurrent. Um, so Swift uses concurrency. Swift 5.5 um, expands concurrency support via the actor model. I honestly don't know more than this. I haven't dug into concurrency in Swift super deeply, but I know that this is a pretty recent addition. And the last thing we're gonna say about concurrency is Swift actually doesn't, from what I can tell, support true parallelism. Even though um, your devices, like an iPhone typically has multiple cores, uh, the language itself seems to block parallel behavior. And that's actually a pretty common thing. Um, I honestly don't know why. I assume it's just, I assume the concept of race conditions and things like that must just be um, too hard to protect against. So um, Swift just doesn't employ par true parallelism, but it supports concurrency. Uh, garbage collection. The, there's two, when you talk about garbage collection, um, Swift uses, if you'll remember from that first slide, Swift uses a reference counting, which is a uh, one of the main algorithms for uh, garbage collection. So let's really quickly talk about what that means. Um, 
Reference counting means um, just saying, how many references do I have to this object or to this variable? Do I have zero? Okay, then we're gonna remove that from memory, but do I still have one or do I have two or do I have five? Okay, then we keep it in memory. And that's all reference counting is. And, and that's what Swift uses. That's a, it's a pretty simple thing to understand. Um, the other one, and reference counting has been around for a long time. It's not a new thing. Uh, the other algorithm is what's called the mark sweep algorithms. And what that means is that um, at some point in time, there is a garbage collector process that will, will go through your code's tree of memory and it will check, okay, where, how many references does this have now? If there's none, then let's just like sweep it out of there. We're going to mark it and then we're just going to sweep everything out. That's where the name comes from. Um, mark sweep has a couple different variations it's called stop the world garbage collection. That's the basic. And what that means is that if you've ever run an application and you notice like a blip of pause in there, that's likely because the garbage collector was running. Um, it just has to run at some point in time. And that stops the world of your application for you know a second or two. Um, there's concurrent mark sweep, which tries to fix that. And then there's generational as well. That just means it focuses on um, the, if it's a younger um, piece of memory that's been allocated, usually it gets dereferenced the quickest because it's, you know, think of like a local variable and a function. Whereas if it's a longer running, um, item in memory. Usually there's probably a good chance it's not going to get wiped out in that particular step. So generational tries to think of it like the generation of memory. Um, Swift does not use mark sweep, so none of this applies there. It uses automatic reference counting. I think that's just standard reference counting. It just checks how many references does the thing have that I'm using. If it goes to zero, then I remove it. It's, it's as easy as that. There's a problem though, um, in what, what, you know, circular dependency is if I have A is, has B as a dependency, but B then has A as a dependency. If you think about like two classes that, you know, use each other, then that's a problem because these will never get to zero. So they'll never get garbage collected, even if they are unused. Um, so that's a pretty common problem with reference counting. Swift handles that with, um, the weak or unowned keywords. You can define variables as weak or unowned. Um, I don't know the fundamentals of how they work, but I do know that um, if you noticed high memory in your app and you're unsure what's going on, this is a tool that you can actually employ to, to help improve that. Um, functional programming. Swift is not a functional programming language. To be a functional programming language, there's, there's really no requirements you need to meet, but languages like Haskell and Erlang and um, Elixir are... Um, functional programming, but Swift does employ some of the concepts. So for those functions as first class citizens, that's a very functional programming uh, concept. Many languages do that and Swift is one of those. It makes things, it's very nice. It's the idea of being able to, you know, send a call back as a variable, for example. And also map filter functions are indicative of functional programming. It's the idea of you employ a function that then accepts a function as well as a parameter to do stuff with. So map will iterate through an enumerable to you know, run a function on, on whatever data you have. Filter will uh, run a function to see should this data be included in this array or not. Um, there's many other higher order functions, but these are some of the most common ones. And again, they're just, they're built off of functional programming concepts. But uh, Swift is not a functional programming language. So why is that? Typically to be a true functional programming language, which they're really one of those doesn't fundamentally exist. Haskell is the closest one. Um, would be a pure function. What it has to employ pure functions. What that means, it means a bunch of things, um, but it means that you cannot modify state at all in your function. And there's many different definitions for what that means. You can't print out to your console. You can't access a third party API like a file system. You can't use random numbers. Basically, anytime you invoke the function, it has to return exactly the same value given the arguments you pass in. Um, it's very hard to do that and be productive at the same time, but it's very, you can, you can make, you can make functions pure, but an entire application will likely not involve hundred percent pure functions. Um, referential transparency, it means that same idea. If I pass in, um, if I call a function that runs uh, that with a set amount of variables, it always has to return the same value. That's what that means. And then in functional programming, your variables have to be immutable as well. You just can't change them once you set them. So variables become more like constants than they do um, variables. So in Swift and many other languages, you know, you've got the, uh, you've got your um, um, your let keyword for setting constants. They encourage you to do that as much as you can. Uh, but if you need to, you have that var keyword as well to set a, an actual variable. Okay, last section of programming concepts is imperative versus declarative programming, and then we can all we can all take a take a breath. Um, 
An imperative programming language is likely what you are very familiar with. It means a language that you are telling the code exactly what to do. Um, and you're giving the specific operations that it needs to run. That you might think that's every programming language and most of them it is, but there are some that are different, uh, like declarative and actually, um, okay, we talked about this, where you tell your code what to do for imperative programming. So Swift storyboard is imperative. You are defining exactly what it is that you wanna do. Um, however, when we talk about declarative programming, this is less where you tell your code what to do and more about um, you're describing what you want to do. And that sounds weird, but I would say, think about uh, SQL. Um, whenever I'm querying data with SQL or SQL, I'm not actually writing the querying algorithms. I'm saying, give me this data from this table where these conditions are true. And that's it. Like I didn't have to write a loop. I didn't have to filter anything out. Uh, I just described what I want. And that's how um, Swift UI actually is. And we'll talk about that, and that's the app we'll show at the very end. We'll use Swift UI. Um, but Swift UI is declarative. An example of that is, um, oh, I think I injected this a little bit too soon. Um, I meant to show a little visual here that I think I have. If I don't, we'll show it up at the very end with the code. But um, for more programming concepts, I really am interested in a lot of these. So I've written a handful of blog posts about them. You can go to um, the codeboss.dev blog and find them there. There's a nice button for programming concepts. It actually doesn't include all of the ones we talked about, but there's also a couple that um, are here that we haven't talked about. So um, check it out. I just, I enjoy digging into the internals of how languages work. So again, that's just the codeboss.dev slash blog. Um, there's that URL. Okay. Um, let's, we're on the home stretch here and then we'll do a demo. Let's talk a little bit about what storyboard is versus Swift UI. So storyboard and XIB, uh, I'm not quite sure how to say that, honestly. I, I really haven't used storyboard much. Uh, I'm just gonna say interface builder files. Um, but interface builder files and storyboard files are user interface files. Um, XIBs are one view controller, storyboards are many. If you've coded with Swift, this is probably what you've done most of your career. Um, here's an example. You have your storyboard in your, uh, um, you've got your UI here for dragging and dropping everything. And um, it's very much an imperative style of coding where you're saying, put this thing here and do this with it. Swift UI is a little bit different. Uh, so this is a very GUI driven approach. And storyboard's an imperative style of development. We mentioned that. There's some problems with that that any imperative language will have, but specifically for Swift, uh, Interface Builder was released in 1988. That's clearly a long time ago, which doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but as far as a GUI process goes, that's quite a while. Um, the most recent versions were released in March of 2011, which uh, don't worry, that's, that's not bad because it became part of Xcode right after that and continued development there. Um, behind the scenes, storyboards and interface builder files generate a lot of XML, and it's it's I just kind of call those things fluff. Honestly, it's just a lot that you're not coding yourself, and you need a tool to do that. You need the interface builder, and that just that becomes brittle after a while. You know, imagine you know how do you merge a three thousand or thirty thousand file interface builder file um, if there's conflicts or anything like that in in, in version control? It can be really challenging. Um, and also your UI and your code are pretty separated, which doesn't have to be a bad thing, but it's just a fundamental difference from Swift, how Swift UI works. So Swift UI, during um, WWDC 2019, Apple announced Swift UI with Xcode 11. So Swift UI is declarative. And I think this might be, yeah, this is where I have the picture I was thinking of. So this is an example of defining a view with Swift UI and focus on this body part. We have a list view here uh, with the, Thing we're iterating through, we're iterating through that. And inside of each of these items in this list, we have an image, uh, a vertical stack that will then allow us to lay two text items on top of each other. And we're setting a color here as well. This is us using declarative programming in Swift to say, this is what we want. Um, you do it however you want to. We're not saying put it exactly over here, although we have those, we have that ability. It's very much a descriptive way of coding. And there's many benefits of that. You get more power in my opinion, and less fluff to worry about. You know, there's no, there's no behind scenes file that this gets parsed as that you have to add to version control. Like this is the file. Uh, there's problems, of course, uh, the community of Swift UI is new, you know, it's been around since 2019. So there's just going to be less stack overflow support. Um, and that's, that's a problem. And there's no objective C support in the Swift UI files. There's nothing stopping you from using a Swift file that uses objective C tools and then, you know, adding it as a variable as, you know, if it was a class, 
at putting it as a variable in your Swift UI file, but in Swift UI views themselves, um, you cannot use Objective-C for GUI purposes. So the goals of Swift UI were to simplify the dev process, um, unify the experience, expand your platform support, all that just to mean, I think this picture says that the best, honestly. The goal is to have a Mac OS app, an iPad app, and an iOS app here. This is all the same view, basically. It's just renders differently. So if you think about responsive design as like for web development, Swift UI is the goal for that, um, um, for the, the Apple side of things, for Swift side. Okay, in the future, this is our last big section, and this is where we're gonna get into um, um, my, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of making assumptions here. My dogs have started barking, so I, I told you that was gonna happen. So um, for cross-platform support, I think we all were hoping for this uh, really starting in, in 2017. So will Swift ever be Android's main language? That's the question we were all asking. Well, it's hard to say. There's a lot of stuff going on around that. Uh, in 2017, there were a lot of rumors that Google might support Swift uh, for Android. However, also in 2017, Google announced uh, Android support for Kotlin which had been around for a little bit. And in 2019, they said Kotlin was the preferred language for Android. So it's kind of looking like Swift will not be you know, a, a big use case on Android anytime soon. Um, that doesn't mean it might not be an option at some point, but it sounds like Google is not headed in the direction of employing it as the main tool. And that's kind of a bummer. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of annoying to have to think, I'm you know, learning this language for this platform, this language for this platform. But that's okay. So it gives us a ton of power and you know, it ties us directly into Apple's core APIs and that's just very powerful. Um, but Swift is headed in another direction as it would seem. So we all know that Swift is you know, supported on Apple platforms. That's the whole goal of it. Well, in 2018, Swift started being able to be run on Linux um, for non GUI applications um, and on Windows actually in 2020. So that's obviously very new, it's recent. Um, you know, we can't write GUI applications because, you know, that would depend on, you know, the storyboard editor or Swift UI, which then, uh, you know, we can still only build an actual app on a, on a Mac device, but for, you know, more server driven applications or experiences, um, Swift can be run on Linux and Windows. And there's, you can read all about it on the getting started page for Swift for installation rules and everything. Um, to go along with this in October 2018, Apple announced work on what's called a language server protocol support for Swift. That's a text editor type thing for support. Uh, a month later, they introduced SourceKit LSP. The LSP stands for language server protocol. So just a quick deep dive into what an LSP is. It's a protocol defined by Microsoft back in the day, and it just makes your editors be able to um, interact with your um, programming languages in a more standardized fashion. So I think this next graphic helps explain a lot of that. Here we've got, um, I'm pretty sure that's Kotlin. I should have looked that up beforehand, but Swift, C Sharp. Well, each text editor, we've got Vim, VS Code, and um, Xcode here, will have to interact with these languages in a different way. It's, um, uh, it's a big permutation here. Well, with LSP, for languages that support LSPs or have LSP toolkits, the languages has to support, whoops, the LSP bit, and then the text editors themselves will use the rules for that. Um, so it's a very intermediary thing, and, and Swift has officially, as of 2018, been working on this. So getting back to the future bit, uh, cross-platform support isn't all the way there. If you look at the installation instructions for Linux and Windows, you will see it is kind of a pain. You have to install a lot of dependencies in unique ways, so it's not there yet. Um, so. These are some of the areas where it falls short. LSP support, that's, all, that's still in progress. The community is, there's really the, the only community for Swift right now would be you know, an Apple-driven community. And ease of use of installation is not there. But I think over the years, it sounds like Swift and Apple will focus on this. It sounds like it'll be a thing. So I wouldn't be surprised if in four or five years, it wouldn't be too uncommon to write, you know, like server scripts or behind the scenes processes in Swift. Um, and again, it can be compiled, so you have some of the benefits there that you have with Go and Rust and all that. Uh, that's all theoretical right now, though. So that's the talk. Um, I know it's a lot to go through. Uh, this will get posted up on YouTube, so if this was you know too much to handle, I'd get that. Um, but check it out, because uh, there's a lot that we went over here. But the demo, I just wanted to throw it in here because it's something that I'm kind of proud of. Um, like I said, I'm not a... Uh, 
um, a Swift developer. This is my first Swift app. I'm sure I did a ton of things wrong, but um, um, it was fun for me. So the whole point of the application, I'll do a quick demo of it, is I was, uh, uh, my wife and I were blessed with a son in February. It's our first son, whose name is Cyrus. And I, uh, what you might not know about me is that I am a beautiful singer. Um, and that's not true at all, but I, I can shred some karaoke. I just, I enjoy it. So I like singing with with my son, Cyrus. Um, and what I found myself doing over and over again was trying to think of songs in my head and um, and then looking at the lyrics because there's, you know, whether you know a song, you know, super well, usually you, there's like 90% you know, and then you have to like flub your way through the next, that 10% you don't know. I, I, just, I wanted to look at the lyrics to every song just so I didn't have to worry about that. And we would sing and everything. But what I kept noticing is, I would never be able to think of a song and I would know in my head, I know hundreds of songs that I like know the lyrics to and I just couldn't think of them. And then at the same time, I found myself doing the same ones over and over again. So what I started thinking was, what if I could build an app that tied to a data bit of some sort where I just had to list the names of the songs and like the artist and the name of it and I could categorize it as you can see here. And, um, and I would just, it would find lyrics for me. And I started digging into that and I started thinking like, okay, there's lyrics APIs, but then I would need to have like, I need to find the ID for every song I was looking at. And then also the lyric APIs, you know, they, they're they usually not super free or they'll be free, but if you need like lyric information, you have to pay. Um, I looked into a lot of that. And then I started thinking, well, if I Google it, maybe I could screen scrape Google and Google has got some pretty good protections against that. So then I just thought, okay, simplest idea what if i tie it to a data set of some sort which i did uh, in the app i'm it's just on my phone it's not a public app it's, i call it cyrus lyrics and i just have um like a list of songs basically um categories subcategories which is artist names really and then just the name of the song like using this data right here what if i could just find the song and, and load it up in a web view so that's what i do so I go to Disney here and, um, you know, it loads up this, it categorizes it based on this category. Got my subcategories here. So if I was singing some Moana, um, we'll click on that. I've got some Moana songs here. And um, the big one is how far I'll go. And that will load up a web view that, you know, just loads it up. It's, it's literally just a web view here. And that's, that's it. That's all I wanted um, to get, to get going. Now I did add an additional feature. I'm also a big fan of um, shuffling songs and, um, um, uh, like I, if I listen to an album, I just shuffle through it. So I, I build a little shuffle feature that allows you to shuffle through songs based on where you're at. So if you're at categories, you can shuffle through it here and it will like bring up some songs here. So we have Crawling by Linkin Park. Uh, and these are, these are, a lot of these songs are like really good ones that I like. Like everybody loves the rhythm of the knife for sure. But most of them are songs that I can just shred through like karaoke, like they're powerful songs. Um, so you won't find everything. I gotta have some '90s there. Anyway, you get you get the point. These are songs that are just fun to sing for me. Um, so let's get into the code a little bit because it's all written in Swift UI. Um, and honestly, I built most of this. I, I have never really written. I've written minimal Swift before, but I've written you know I've written code in a lot of different languages. So Swift is pretty easy to get going with. The biggest thing to understand is just how the view system works. Um, I wrote a lot of this, and I'd say about four to five hours on a day off that I had. And then I went back, you know, over the weekend and added some new features like the whole shuffle process. Um, but starting off, you know, with the main Swift app, we've got the base files here, you know, the, the main Swift file, some other info P list, the assets, um, those are pretty standard. Where we have our main entry point is this content view. I didn't change the name of that. And this is the main um, list view right here. And I will see if I can zoom in just a smidge here. I probably should have zoomed in a little bit more there. But I think that covers, you know, you can see that. And that is, if you've never written Swift UI before, that literally is, let me go back to the very home page. That literally is this whole page right here. Like this is all the code I wrote for it. Um, now you'll notice there's this data manager object up here that, that handles getting the data, um, but nothing UI related. So just to kind of walk through it, we've got our navigation view that um, gives me, it gives me the styling for this title and it lets me go if I like dig into one of these that automatically will handle the back button here. Um, grant, I guess the navigation title ties into that, but this whole process is handled by navigation view. We've got a list that digs through the categories that we get from my data manager. And we have navigation links that say where they need to go, like what view they load up. And then just that, you know, in the actual item, we have a text for the name of the category. That's how we get this 90s classic country dance, et cetera. And that's actually all the view. The other things here, navigation title and toolbar, that sets up, um, these buttons here, so we have two buttons. 
a refresh button here um, where I have a little custom action where I just call the function and I set the image to the arrow clockwise image. And then I created a view for shuffle toolbar item. That's just, it's basically a, that button right there. And we can even look at that. I think it does a little bit of something like figures out, oh no, that's the shuffle manager. Uh, that's a whole, that's a data thing. This is the actual view. Yeah, so it's just a, that's it. I'm just pulling in that view. So nothing too crazy here, but it's very, it's very simple is I think the big thing I'm getting at. And as we, as we dig into these, like let's, let's just dig in a little bit more. If I dig into um, Disney there, it's a very simple view. It's a list. And we're now in the category view, category detail view. And it's even simpler. It's just a list here, um, which just links to other things. And then even when we get to, um, you know, beyond this, we get to the subcategory view. And then um, we, uh, you know, got Cinderella there. And then we've got another one. Um, if we dig into this view is actually the, uh, the link detail view. And that's, you know, it's very simple here. We just basically say, um, um, we put a V stack in here. Um, Let's see, the big thing you're seeing here is we're using a Swift UI web view, which is a component that I built, but it's basically, it uses all the components that Swift came with. I didn't have to install a web UI tool or anything. Um, and, you know, this this has, a, you know, a few different if checks, which again, I'm, I'm sure I'm doing not the best Swift way, but uh, it, it's been fun for me to build so far. But that's it, like this, this one has a little bit more code. Um, I set a couple settings, I prevent the screen from um, going idle, you know, little things like that. But that's it. Like as far as view stuff goes, like this is the styling for um, this page, and that's been coming from a world of web development and front end development. It's just been really nice to tell Swift UI what I want to do, and then be able to make modifications as I need to, as opposed to thinking I have to style absolutely everything. Um, and honestly, um, I don't know. This has been this has been a lot of fun for me. As far as this goes, um, while this app is not in the App Store by any means, um, it is. Um, it is like publicly on my GitHub and there's, there's nothing hidden in there. It just has a hard coded link to, uh, to my awesome, uh, Google sheet link here. There's a couple other things I mentioned here that don't really apply. Basically it, it, you can put in a Spotify URL. And if that's the case, you might've seen, um, you know, open up the Spotify button for some of these that just, it's just a link. And if you have Spotify installed, then, you know, your, your uh, operating system on your phone will handle that. Um, Sometimes the Google links are don't work. Like it just won't show up the lyrics. Um, if I say like search for light in the sky by Lee Banjo 3, it won't show up like the right lyrics or something like that. So I, I like an override lyric thing in there. Anyway, we're getting into the 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 details that are more business logic as opposed to like Swift stuff. But um, um, that's, that's kind of it. And then sometimes I use these services like Shuffle Manager and Data Manager. These are Swift files that just get the data. They're not Swift UI, so you can use you can employ Swift files with Swift UI. Um, yeah, there's um, and here I'll expand the structs directory out. There's a couple of structs I have in here. Um, honestly, this is a pretty small application for just a little fun project I was doing. Um, so that's it. I just wanted to demo that real quick and to, if anyone is in the process of learning Swift UI, to show that it's not scary. It's very. It's honestly, it's you can do make a lot happen without. Um, without knowing too much. Um, and then you just Google up questions when you have them. So that is it going back to the talk, uh, which is over. Thanks. I am Aaron Krauss. So you can find me on the code boss .dev. Um, again, I work at clever. Uh, we're at clever.com as well. If you have any interest in be, you know, working with us as a client, reach out, or if you would like to work with us as a you know, employee, again, we're looking for devs, designers, project managers. That's, that's the big area we're looking for right now. Um, just hit me up or go to Clever and, and you'll find us from there. So that is it. That's the talk for, for real. Uh, I will open it up for questions here. And yeah, if you